Hey guys, what's up? I'm Jessie. If you've been to this channel before, then you've heard me complain about YouTube ballistic gel tests many times. So it's only fair that if I'm going to complain, I explain to you guys why. For this video, we're going to talk about kind of the limitations of gel, the differences of gel on the market, and how to actually go about analyzing a gel block. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and let's get started. So to kind of start us off, it's important to understand restrictions that gel can present in understanding your round's performance. Probably one of the biggest things to note is that gel isn't going to be able to kind of replicate the elasticity or like the bounce back that living tissue would have. We don't like to think of it, but our muscles are very elastic. They can withstand a lot and different types of tissues can do this better than others. Like lung tissue, for example, is able to withstand a temporary cavity extremely well without taking damage, whereas some of your other organs, not so much. And it also does make a difference in regards to muscle density, fat layering, various organs, tissue types, and bones, especially shot placement in regarding to surrounding layering and how those areas are able to expand and contract upon impact. You don't get that biological feedback that you would get upon hitting a living target. And of course, adrenaline exists, different people, different animals, different living organisms handle things different ways. So there is a very personal factor that's going to wind up playing a role as well. But we're aware of this. It's stuff that we know in the industry. So we're able to compensate and compare for these results. There is a lot of history out there, a lot of knowledge out there that does show how these things perform in living tissue. So we can take that information and kind of extrapolate what the gel block is telling us. It's like shooting into a jug of water. We do know it heavily exaggerates expansion performance, but we also know what expansion performance looks like on target so we can compare those two results. So now that we kind of have an understanding of what gel can and can't do, it's also important to understand that gel testing is very environmentally sensitive, especially in regards to temperature, not only during the manufacturing process, but as well as during the testing event. Variations in manufacturing can alter your results. The rate at which you heat up and cool the gelatin can change its structure and affect things like transparency, clarity, firmness of your block if done incorrectly, too incorrectly. In addition to that, the temperature that you fire the block into, typically it's fired at 40 degrees Fahrenheit is the ideal internal temperature. A little colder and suddenly your block is firmer and your penetration and expansion might be understated. A warmer block is going to be softer and in turn you'll get potentially over exaggeration on what those results may be. So a proper gel test, proper gel making does actually become kind of cumbersome and nuanced. It's also important to understand the variations of gel available to market. The gelatin that you go pick up at the store is not the same gelatin that's used for ballistic gel and even amongst ballistic gel manufacturers, depending on the intent of the test, there are different methods, different types that are preferred to help kind of mimic certain situations better. Organic ballistic gel is typically manufactured from pig fat. We like to call people long pigs for a reason, but you can imagine the pig gelatin is going to be able to kind of mimic the muscle structures. And this is also often done with 250 bloom. 250 is standard for 10 and 20% gel blocks. You might see 200. There are variations depending on the specific type of testing, a much wider range. But basically what the bloom number represents is going to be the firmness of your gel block. So a higher bloom number is going to be a more firm structure. There's a lot of variation in the type of gel that is available to the market. And what you commonly see on YouTube is going to be those clear, crystal clear blocks being tested. So kind of just a base difference are organic gel blocks and synthetic gel blocks. The organic ones are going to be made of your animal proteins. Whereas the synthetic ones, I don't actually know what those are made of. So just between those two, base types as is, there is going to be a lot of performance differences, pros and cons for each. On top of the fact that you can start to have a conversation of your 
gel percentage. So the synthetic gel, what you often see on YouTube, is meant to replicate a 10% gel block, which is the FBI standard. That's considered muscle tissue, but softer muscle tissue, if that makes sense. Synthetic gel blocks are great. They are way less temperature sensitive, so you have a lot more wiggle room allowing for your testing circumstances before the results aren't considered calibrated. And the synthetic gel blocks are much more reusable. Different people will tell you different opinions on if the organic blocks are or aren't, but even if you do reuse it, they have an extremely short reusability, whereas the synthetic blocks can be done multiple times without compromising the performance. And on top of that, they are crystal clear. So of course this is great for visuals and demonstrations because you don't have to sit there and struggle to guess what the round actually did once you're done firing. So it makes sense that this became the standard for YouTube gel testing. It's easier for companies to ship these blocks out to people. It's easier for the viewers to see the results. But it's also important to understand that the synthetic blocks overestimate the results compared to what organic does. Even 10% synthetic versus 10% organic, while they are both 10% compositions, the synthetic block is going to give you a much more dramatic temporary cavity effect. It's going to really heavily exaggerate what that expansion moment looks like, what those hydrostatic shocks and everything like that look like, and how your penetration is going to perform as opposed to an organic block would do. I feel like it's necessary to clarify this before you guys absolutely tear me apart in the comments. While synthetic gel blocks can be built to FBI and NATO standards, it's not Usually what's available on the commercial market, I have no clue what those are standardized and calibrated to. I don't see YouTubers calibrate when they go to fire them. So it's not something that you can give a fair metric or comparison to. I also think it's important to note that while the industry does use these types of blocks, it's pretty exclusively limited to demonstrations, press events, shot show, things like that, where you do want to make sure that the consumer can get a clear picture. But when you talk about actual testing, data collecting, organic is almost exclusively what you will see in the testing environments. Those blocks are typically considered the best for visual dramatics, demonstrations. You see a lot of companies use that when showing off a new round just to easily visualize what it is capable of. But from a realistic standpoint, they are not going to be reflective of IRL performance. Between 10 and 20%, probably more akin to your organic blocks. While I did mention the 10% is the FBI standard, 20%, which is largely unrecognized amongst the internet community, is going to actually be the NATO standard. So while DOD applications, military tests, that kind of world of ammo usage does still use 10%, testing is going to have to be done at 20% for the sake of achieving certain information and is much more common to see within that community and kind of considered that standard. While 10% and 20% both represent muscle tissue and mimic that well, 20% is more <laughs> indicative of fit muscle tissue. So while I do have muscle here, there's not much, but someone who's, you know, not pathetic like me, uh, definitely has denser muscle and it's going to be a lot different to get through, which you could imagine your soldiers and stuff are trained, fit, in shape, and probably have much denser tissue than I do. Now, unfortunately, 20% of course is going to be harder to see through, making assessment a little bit more difficult, a little bit more nuanced, and for both 10 and 20%, the organic blocks are much more temperature sensitive and do need a little bit more care in regards to calibration. The clear gel is going to heavily over exaggerate your performance results, but that's not to say that the organic gel isn't capable of doing that either. For both 10 or 20%, you can wind up over underestimating penetration. But the idea is that if you calibrate it to know how it's going to perform and it's within that metric, then you have a baseline to assess with. So now that we know some of the limitations, we understand some of the different types of gel available on market. How do we actually assess a block? I said it needed to be calibrated. Typically you see people shoot those little steel BBs, the 4.5 millimeter ones, into the corner of a block. You want that round to be going about 490 feet per second. 
and it should penetrate about three and a half inches, 3.3 to like 3.75 is kind of considered a good window. And if it's performing at that point, then congratulations, your block is calibrated. These shots are taken about 10 to 15 feet from the end of the muzzle to the start of the block. So not a very far distance for shooting at all. Once we're certain it's calibrated, you can take your shot. There are a lot of things that you can look at and YouTube really loves to look at these slow-mo assessments, which they're fun to see, I understand it. But in real world applications, slow-mo assessments are typically reserved for being able to understand y'all that bullet behavior upon impact and as it's moving through the gel it does allow us to kind of look at the temporary cavity though this one is not a perfect science and is heavily debated within the community the permanent impacts of your temporary cavity are extremely subjective and don't exactly provide consistent results. Another thing that slow-mo footage is great for is if there are barriers in use with the gel block. It does allow you to see how the round impacts with that barrier prior to entering the block. Those after shot results are great to look at, but of course, slow-mo allows you to see the frame by frame of how they're interacting. With the actual block though, of course, the characteristics that we care about when assessing this is going to be your penetration depth or typically like with rifles, you see them go through. So you wanna see how deep the projectile went into the block, your cavity diameter. So kind of that max width of the cavity along the primary path and your neck lengths. Necking is kind of going to be the point where the projectile first enters the block, measured out to the point in which you can start to see that initiation event in those much more expansive permanent cavity. We care about necking because that's the point in which the round started to initiate within the medium. And obviously if it initiates too late in the block, then none of that energy is going on to target. If it initiates too soon, then the round probably isn't gonna be great with penetration, other concerns like that. And then of course, easy things to see within the block are going to be its trajectory. Is the flight path straight? Did the round start to tumble at some point while in the block? Does it have early yaw, which is going to be more destructive? Does it have inconsistent yaw? Is it unreliable? How is that pathing looking upon impact? Something else that's often tested with gel blocks is going to be the effect of entry angle. Of course, it's easy to shoot straight into the block, but realistically, you're probably going to be shooting at different angles in a real world setting and you need to know how the round performs through those various angles of attack. That's all basic information that we can see without taking the gel block apart, but the part of dissections that is really not given enough love at all is in fact the dissection. Yeah, you're gonna take a knife to your gel block and you are gonna cut that open and try to get all of the fragments out that you can. When assessing gel blocks, it's important to understand your fragment size and location, location within the primary cavity. You wanna know the number of fragments that are available and their sizes. Fragment types, so the shape of the fragment, whether it's chunky, flaky, splintered, etc. And then of course, for like expanding rounds, you wanna know the diameter. The industry does have ways to kind of map this out, but even without doing that, you can kind of compare weight retention and all of those characteristics between shots. When you're looking at the fragments in relation to the primary wound channel, you can kind of think of it like a tree with the main branch being your track level like zero. And then each of the fragments are gonna kind of branch off into their smaller little tree branches being your ones. Rarely do you see twos coming off of those ones, so on and so forth. But you can almost map out an image of what that tree branch looks like inside of the gel block. And all of that information will help you understand more of your secondary kind of effects of wounding mechanism. Of course, a bullet going through is going to hurt and going to do damage, but those fragments as the projectile kind of pulls itself apart, if it does fragment in target, a lot of really tiny fragmentation far out from the primary wound channel isn't gonna be as lethal. Whereas larger fragments relatively close to that primary path are going to have a lot more detrimental impact in the long term. So not only is weight retention important, but where that weight is going within the round. So while YouTube gel tests are great and can provide a lot of information, you see a lot of guys look at the slow-mo, you see a lot of guys look at that penetration depth in the temporary cavity, 
it is very much not the full picture of what a gel block test is going to entail. Those YouTube gel tests typically ignore any sense of calibration, standardization, and more common than not at this point, all use the synthetic gel, which is going to heavily exaggerate your results. And while that's not necessarily bad, if you know what you're looking at, it's not a fair way to evaluate how a round is compared to something else on the market when you consider the fact that different projections compositions will be more or less impacted by the restrictions that a synthetic block could provide. Some rounds will be exaggerated more than others just through their basic construction. And if you don't understand that going into the assessment, you wind up getting false comparisons between projectiles. Something else that's important to note is that not all rounds are going to look good in gel just because the block might be a lackluster visual doesn't mean it's not performing how it was designed. I think the general populace likes to assume that all rounds need to perform to all possible scenarios. And while some use applications will give visually appealing gel block performance, that's not necessarily the case for all rounds. And that doesn't mean that the round isn't performing how it was designed to perform. I'm watching the time as I'm recording this and this looks like it's going to be a really long one. So thank you guys for bearing with me on this. I actually tried to cut some out to shorten it up, but hope you all like the video. I hope to do more like this and I hope to see you on the next one. Bye.